it was difficult to digest, uh, whether you look at it 22 wins or 60 losses. Uh, that's not the kind of season we wanted to have. And uh, we went into this year uh, with a lot of uncertainty, not knowing exactly what we had. Uh, we had hopes of uh, being a competitive team. Uh, some of that was derailed uh, with injuries. Uh, some of it was derailed just with uh, a lack of talent generally. And uh, at some point, you uh, conclude that it's probably best to move in another direction. And uh, we embarked upon a plan uh, sometime early in the season. I'd say it was sometime uh, late November that uh, ultimately led to uh, a few key points that uh, were, were addressed. Uh, we talked about developing our youth first and foremost. Uh, we talked about acquiring additional assets. And we talked about creating or preserving additional cap flexibility for this team as we move forward with the uncertain rules uh, that lie ahead. And uh, I knew that uh, at the time, Jay Triano and I would be looking at a situation where we would have to you know, check our respective uh, egos, desires, et cetera, at the door and uh, put the best interests of the franchise, uh, both long-term and short-term, ahead of us, ahead of our own. Uh, but it was an important thing to do uh, as we embarked upon uh, a rebuilding. And uh, there's that word that certainly didn't want to use last year and, and uh, hoped for you know, the opportunity to do otherwise. But the reality called for us to uh, rebuild this team. Uh, so we did embark upon the plan, as I outlined. Uh, it's nice to see some of the things develop from this year. Uh, again, I, I know it's hard to digest uh, losing so many games, but it was certainly fun watching this young team play. Uh, I've gotten tremendous feedback from season seat holders at the various functions that I've been at. Uh, we've gotten all kinds of uh, positive uh, comments regarding uh, the youth of the team. Uh, they're fun to watch. Uh, great talent. Uh, you see uh, great things happening with some good young players. Uh, we have a very young team. It's all been written about and talked about. But uh, you know, this is uh, this is the painful part of uh, rebuilding. You, you lose a lot of games. So what's bright on the horizon? You've got players that are now developed and have had an opportunity to cut their teeth even deeper in this league. Uh, you've got uh, a top five draft pick uh, that should yield a very talented player to add to this mix. We've got a core of players, as I mentioned, that uh, have come together and not only enjoy playing the game, but enjoy playing together. And they enjoy playing in Toronto, which is uh, uh, in, and, in and of itself a, a victory. So a number of positive things are, are stemming from this. and. Um, I think people are responding well in the marketplace. Uh, at, as of uh, Friday, uh, our season seat renewals and our new season seats sold are pacing ahead of last year and the year prior. Uh, so you know that should say something. I, I don't think it's all related to the price decrease. <laughs> I think some of it relates to, obviously, the, uh, the nature of this team and, and the encouragement that uh, we're getting from the fans. So. Uh, some of the bright spots, I'll just mention the, the, the core players now. Uh, you look at DeMar DeRozan, what he's done. Uh, his scoring average obviously jumped uh, about double, if not exactly double. Uh, he still has a long way to go, but you can see him hitting stride as a bright young talent in this league. Um, a lot of people doubted that last year when he finished the season uh, not on the rookie team, all rookie team. Uh, only averaging eight or nine points. And I think that, uh, you know, if he now becomes the full package, which would entail him developing a three point threat, getting much better defensively, and even rebounding the ball better, these are all things that I talked to him about. Uh, he's got a chance to be a special player. His second year numbers. Uh, are much better, or better in some cases, than, than a number of the top athletic scoring wings in the, in the game. You can 
list Kobe Bryant, Monte Ellis, Joe Johnson, others. You know, this, this is a young man with immense talent who's just 21 years old. I'll stick with the 21 year olds. Ed Davis uh, obviously had a, a setback early, uh, might have even been part of the reason that we fast forwarded this conclusion that we needed to rebuild. Uh, but he was a, a young man that, despite missing camp and despite uh, missing a good month and a month and a half of the season, uh, he stepped into the NBA and, and uh, proved that he belongs. And you can see him being a double-double producer night in and night out in this league for many years to come. I think he's got uh, a great instinct for the game. I think he's got a nose for the ball. He's got a nice soft touch around the rim, and uh, when you watch him play, uh, you can see some of those things that uh, got us excited about that pick last year when we got him at 13. And again, I think if you redid the last two drafts, DeMar DeRozan is drafted somewhere much higher than number nine, and I think that uh, Ed Davis is drafted somewhere much higher than number 13. So compliments to our scouting staff and, and uh, the rest of the management team for putting us in a position to, to make those selections. Um, then you move into the 22-year-old category. You've got uh, Jared Bayless, who came as a, a mid-season addition. Tough position to be in. A little bit awkward for another young guy to, to come into a, a locker room of competitive people and uh, carve his niche. But, uh, Kid had great numbers as a starter. If I'm not mistaken, 18.7 rebounds as a starter in about 18 games this year. The last eight games where he didn't start every game, he averaged 23 points and I believe six assists. But it wasn't just about scoring and you know filling the stat sheet. It was about being a better leader, being a better teammate. And I think he answered the call on a number of fronts. Uh, and just to show the competitive spirit that he's got and the fight and the desire to play defense and get into people. I, th I think, uh, you know, we got something, we got something to, to look forward to there with him. Amir Johnson, I can't believe he's uh, in the 23-year-old category as we speak, but that's where he is. Uh, after six seasons in the league, uh, he posted career numbers, uh, a lot of ridicule, a lot of criticism. Last year about him, getting too much money, uh, you know, how could they do that? It's, it's all on the, the future. Well, you know what, he responded and, and he was, uh, despite late absence in a, in a number of games because of an ankle that, that might even require surgery at some point, um, and that's being determined later this week uh, as he sees a few foot and ankle specialists in the States for second opinions. Uh, it's, it's a situation where, you know, Amir answered the call in a, in a number of ways, but, uh, you know, more than anything, he, he learned how to stay on the floor. I think he played 400 more minutes than he did last year, and he uh, only had about 10 more personal fouls in total. So it, it showed that he learned uh, a little bit more about what it takes to stay on the floor, and I think averaging 26 minutes a game was uh, a feat in and of itself for, for a young guy that had had difficulty staying on the floor. James Johnson, another you know, late addition, uh, came in and, and did a lot of things, but uh, more than anything added some toughness, uh, was a little bit of a wild card on the court for us, a little bit of a wild card in the locker room. Uh, he added some spice or some pepper to the room, if you will, and I think some personality as well. And, uh, you know, he's a good all-around basketball player, uh, has good playmaking instincts, uh, can do a number of things with a big, strong, lively body. And I'm anxious to see what some consistency in terms of playing time and now a summer where he can look forward to a role uh, and, and a, a home where he knows he's going to be a part of things uh, is going to affect him. But if he stays the course, keeps his head down and, and does what he needs to do, he's got a chance to be a good player as well. Uh, and I guess um, the enigma of all enigmas to you and many is uh, Andrea, but uh, Andrea, 24, almost 25, is a guy that uh, obviously can score the ball. He has gotten a little bit better every year offensively. He's proven to be a legitimate 20-point scorer in the game. I think he's got more where that came from and, and has another level to reach. 
offensively, but but clearly he has not done the things that, that we would all like him to do, and that's get better rebounding the ball and uh, defending the rim. He's a pretty good man on ball defender in the post. I think he's, uh, he doesn't get as much credit as he, as he deserves there. But uh, again, what I'm saying is he's far from a perfect player, but um, you know, he's, he's a valuable asset to this organization nonetheless. Um, in addition to the core, we had what I thought was you know, very solid contributions from a number of veteran players, but uh, just highlighting, of course, the, the guys that played the most. Um, Jose Calderon and Leandro Barbosa were very solid pros for us. They did everything we asked them to do. Uh, Leandro did have some injury issues throughout the year. A uh, couple of freak things. Um, I was with Leandro uh, in New York on Thursday, uh, getting an opinion on his wrist and on his finger at the uh, hospital for special surgery where I think Darren Williams just was uh, recently operated on, same doctor, just to, to make sure we weren't doing anything wrong. And the conclusion was it's a non-operative situation right now, which is a positive, I believe, for all of us. Uh, his finger's going to be fine, soft tissue injury, Etc. But uh, you know the wrist. You know there, there's an ongoing injury there, but uh, it's something that he can play with, and and uh, something that right now the doctor said he would stay away from surgery. So uh, as the season wore on, his in, his wrist was actually fine. Uh, he, he even stopped taping the wrist, and uh, it appeared to be okay. But uh, that's something we'll just continue to monitor in the future. And then uh, we had that's with the guards, and and then the big men that uh, you know played uh, well. Uh, Reggie obviously did uh, incredible things for us. Uh, again, coming back from a catastrophic foot injury the year prior, it's it's amazing to see what what he was capable of doing, and it's amazing to see what someone when they dedicate themselves to getting their mind right, their body right, and preparing for an NBA season. Uh, under the circumstances of recovering from an injury, I think Reggie deserves an incredible amount of, of uh, credit for what he was able to accomplish. So I think that uh, you know he uh, he did some some great things in in that regard. And then uh, a guy that that's forgotten a lot is uh, you know Lennis Kleza, who came in. And provided a lot of the things we were looking for from him, uh, but unfortunately, uh, uh, nagging injuries to his Achilles, and ultimately tendonitis to his knee, and ultimately a surgery, derailed his season. But uh, you know, to see what he was capable of doing, uh, we know he's a good, solid basketball player, and and we anticipate that he'll, when healthy, be uh, a much better contributor to this team, and uh, anticipate that that'll happen sometime next season. But again, he's, uh, he's doing well in his rehabilitation. He's going through that process. We've gotten great follow-up reports from Dr. Stedman out in Colorado. And uh, you know, he's been out there for at least one visit already and, and is scheduled to go back in another month, month and a half. And, and good things are, are happening there. He's, uh, he's been very diligent about his protocol, uh, staying off of it with a non-weight-bearing scenario leading to now weight bearing and ultimately uh, back to court work. But it's going to be a long process. But uh, we've seen that microfracture surgery is not something insurmountable. All you got to do is look at the explosiveness that Amari Stoudemire has right now and, and what he's doing with New York. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll open it up for questions and uh, hope I can answer all the things you're looking for. Yes, Beef. So, Brian, you mentioned your players and their youth and everything else. So, yeah. what what uh, areas specifically are you looking to upgrade at this point, heading into the draft? And I mean, is there one area that you really think, despite the promise of these young players, that you really have to address? I think there's a number of things that we have to address um, as we, you know, look at this team. I think we've got. Pretty good depth at, across the board, but you know, do we need to get better at various positions? It's easy to say uh, with a, a team that won 22 games and young guys that have produced well that we've got everybody we need in the pipeline to to get to the next level. But clearly, 
we want to address a few glaring needs. The, the biggest need, in, in my opinion, is that uh, you know, we have not paired a legitimate five next to Andrea Bargnani. If, in fact, uh, Andrea is truly a four, which I believe has always been the case, but he's a versatile enough player to play the other position, should the four be a, a rebounder defender type, uh, we, you can get away with the versatility. Guys are interchangeable uh, in this business. I don't believe that players need to be pigeonholed into a position. You know, we call them ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives. I've always said there's guards, wings, and bigs. And, uh, you know, those three categories, you can put various lineups on the floor. Uh, you know, is, is Serge Ibaka a five or a four? And yet he started next to to uh, Kendrick Perkins last night. I would say that, you know, on our team, he would be a five. But in that team last night, you know, one of those two guys was playing the four position. So you can play various lineups different ways. Um, mentioned to Jay recently, I saw a game. Uh, there was literally uh, two guards, but I wouldn't say a pure point guard. And there were three bigs, and I wouldn't say a pure three out on the floor. I think it was playing for the Utah Jazz. And I, I asked him the question, I said, are you watching this game? You know, who's playing the three? He said, I'm not sure. <laughs> he said, I said, who's playing the point? You know, I'm not sure. It's, it's the versatility and the interchangeability of players, I think, that's important. So whether we say Andre is a four or a five really doesn't matter. But I think we need a bigger, better post presence that not necessarily needs to score the ball down low, but a guy that can handle certain roles or uh, situations defensively. I think defending the rim is one of the primary areas of weakness that we have. And Andrea is not a good help side defender or weak side defender. Uh, and I would also say that uh, we need to get a guy that rebounds the ball. If, if Andrea is going to be lifted a lot or scoring the ball quite often in, in terms of putting up the shots, if he's going to be the guy that puts up the most shots, someone's got to be in a position to rebound the ball. And I thought Reggie did a decent job of that this year, but he's not a legitimate five prospect. He's a, uh, a five that you put into the mix because he can hold someone off of the block. He can rebound the ball well, but there are limitations there. I think we've all seen those limitations. So. At, and, and again, defending the rim is not his forte. So I think that uh, you know, that's probably the biggest area of weakness. Um, I think James Johnson came in and, and uh, made a case for you know, consideration at the three spot. I think, again, when you look at uh, Kleza, who was brought in to play some of the three and even some small four, I think that uh, you know, his versatility uh, is, is something that uh, we missed as the season went on and uh, his ability to, to play the three spot. And we need to address three-point shooting. Some of that, again, was lost with Kaliza, but uh, you know, we need to get better at shooting the ball. I think Bayless answered some of that late. Uh, but uh, you know, there, there needs to be uh, some, some work done there as well. And again, some of that's going to come organically. I think uh, DeMar uh, clearly is going to get better at shooting the ball from, from range. I don't know if he'll ever be a great three-point shooter. I hope he hears this and says, yes, I will be, because he's responded well to, to uh, challenges. So, you know, those are the areas of, of weakness, uh, if you will. And um, overall, defensively, do we have to get better? Yes. You know, is it all personnel? To some degree, yes. Uh, and I'll take my share of the blame for that. But uh, I think we need to, you know, have a mindset we need to have accountability defensively. We need to have uh, a system that's executed well. And those are all areas that uh, we're going to be talking about you know, this summer. Right. More uncertainty this offseason than usual. I mean, possible lockout, your contract status. How do you go into an offseason to continue to build this team with so many of these uncertainties? You know, those, uh, it's part of the game, part of the business. It's not always common that it's, it's you know, groups so uh, together, so much together, or concentrated in the way it is. Uh, there's a lot of issues in play, as you know. Um, possible sale of the team, uh, or 66% of the team. 
Uh, my approach is, is the following, and I, I, I've had this approach all year. I, I'm going to do what's in the best interest of this organization. Uh, until I'm told otherwise, I'm, I'm focused on the duties that, that I have representing this team, uh, you know, in the highest, you know, capability that I have. Um, we're focused on the draft right now. Uh, we're talking about the possibility of free agent scenarios. Uh, we're getting geared up to interpret whatever the rules might be, what they might look like, so that uh, we're ready to, to react accordingly. Um, it's, it's business as usual here, and uh, you know that's, that's the way we're going to kind of move forward. Um, I hope to be back. I want to be back. I'm committed to Toronto. I'm committed to the country of Canada. I'm committed to this organization in the highest way. And uh, again, uh, as you look at you know, the challenges ahead, that's, that's what I'm focused on. Uh, if I'm here and I'm able to finish it, that's, that's my preference. If, if I'm not here, uh, I know that I'm going to walk out of here with my head high, knowing that I did everything I could while I was here, uh, acting in the best interests of, of this organization and uh, hopefully representing the city well. You are here. Are you committed to Jake? You know, uh, I think it's uh, a question that uh, a lot of people want to know. What's Jay's status? Uh, I think it's safe to say that until my situation's resolved, uh, you know, Jay's probably will remain unresolved. And, uh, you know, there is a, a time frame there. Uh, some people said, well, it's going to happen postseason. It is postseason, and it will happen postseason. But uh, there is a timeline, as you know, of mid-June when there, there's somewhat of a deadline there. But again, I think it's safe to say that my situation will probably be resolved before Jay's. Regarding Jay, I, w I would say clearly he did everything we asked him to do this year. Uh, there was a plan in place. Again, I, I mentioned it was not an easy plan. Jay stuck to that plan, uh, to his credit, uh, sacrificing his own reputation along the way. Uh, some of it was injury-induced. <laughs> But a lot of it was because he believed that it was the right thing for this, this organization long term. And uh, I applaud him for that. And uh, I think uh, he deserves a lot of credit in that regard. Uh, to a man uh, walking out of the exit interviews that I had individually with the players over the last couple of weeks, uh, everybody thought Jay under the circumstances did a great job as a coach. And we're talking about players that truly like the guy. You know, that's, that's half the battle in this business. Um, are there things that uh, we set forth as, as performance standards, so to speak, early in the year? Yes. Are we continuing to, to evaluate that? And will we be talking about where he, uh, you know, measured up with those performance standards? Yes. Uh, but I would say he fared well based on an early prognosis. Um, and I would also say that... Uh, if I'm not here, he deserves consideration as a head coach. You must have some indication at this point what your future is with the organization. Brian, it's unchanged. Status is unchanged. It's uh, a week ago it was unchanged. Today it's unchanged. I, I cannot share with you more, and, and it's, uh, it's kind of pointless to continue to speculate about what I might be doing or where I might be. Right now I'm here. And I'm focused on what needs to be done to make this place better. You'll likely have the third overall pick. And I mean, looking at the mock drafts, there's not many true fives out there right now. So are you considering possibly trading that pick to get a five currently in the league? Or will there be too many, too many bigs then if you bring in another five with Bargnani, Davis, and then the two Johnsons already there? Well, you know, I think uh, it's, it's important that you'll, you have an open mind to any way or means to improve the club. Uh, I don't think we're married to the third pick, but uh, trading away a third pick is not a, an easy proposition in most situations. Uh, I don't think anybody on this team is untradeable. I think uh, we have to, again, have, have an open mind and look to, to maximize what our assets are. I've made the point that depending on where we end up, regardless of what we have on the current roster, and how we're built uh, with ongoing commitments. I think we need to take the best available talent 
and let the dust settle from there. And when I say that, talent is obviously, talent equals assets. Assets equal other possibilities, whether it's improving the team, whether it's uh, moving forward uh, with subsequent transactions. I think there's a lot of scenarios that you could argue uh, we need to bring together as much as we can. And I think that's some of what we did this year. Uh, we brought in, uh, as I mentioned, Jared Bayless, and uh, we brought in James Johnson. Uh, I really felt that just in the James Johnson pick scenario where we had that uh, Miami pick, which turned out to be, if I'm not mistaken, 26, uh, adding two more young players to the mix of an already very young team, as I pointed out earlier, that would be a difficult thing for anybody to deal with, much less you know, a, a coach that uh, is trying to you know, bring a group of new faces together. Two new guys that are stepping into an NBA situation for the first time. So James Johnson comes in as a proven talent, but as a guy that uh, has all kinds of upside. And he's already a year and a half into the development process. Now he's two full years into that development process. And uh, you know, I think that that's one of the things we thought about. There may even be duplication with Kaliza in that regard if, if and when Kaliza comes back. But uh, you know, right now we're stockpiling assets, we're stockpiling flexibility, we're stockpiling uh, you know, the, uh, the talent that, that will yield a better overall team next year. And, and again, I like the interchangeability of a lot of these players. Uh, some of the players that are slotted as fives or listed as fives in the draft mocks, uh, excuse me, fours. Uh, are really, in my estimation, guys that can possibly play three. I think some fours can possibly play five. Uh, but, uh, you know, when the dust settles on April 28th, when we have that list of early entering candidates, I'll be able to say more what's, what's the value of the third pick. And then subsequent to that, that May 8th date where players can still pull out and retain NCAA eligibility, that will be probably even more you know, clear at that point what, uh, what the value of the pick is. And someone might value the pick more. It's, uh, it's kind of like if, um, if Washington wins the lottery, do you think they'll take a point guard? Probably not, but all of a sudden they have a pick to possibly trade and create leverage for themselves. You know, that's, that's just one scenario that you might paint. Well, we might be in a similar situation depending on where we end up not only May 8th, but uh, you know, when we know what that list looks like, but May 17th when the draft lottery is conducted in, in New Jersey. I was just going to say, you, you were talking about Andrea and uh, you know, his strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. At this point, do you think we, we know exactly who he is and, and what he can become? You talked about the fact that he can improve offensively, but at the same time you mentioned his defensive shortcomings. Do you have sure. much faith? How much faith do you have in his potential to grow as a defensive player? Well, again, I think it's important to point out you know, that what I do know we have is, is a considerable asset for this organization, despite what many think otherwise. Uh, I also know that um, you've got a, a young man that is playing a very difficult position in this business. Uh, probably, uh, as I said, miscast as the five. But he's our five out of virtue that we don't have someone else to man that position with his kind of size. Big guys take longer than most, as you know. Um, but here you're talking about a seven-foot skilled player that can do limitless things offensively that clearly needs to work on the defensive side of the, the, the game. Um, but. I don't know that he's ever going to be a better defensive player than what he is. Can he be a better rebounder? Absolutely. And that becomes, I believe, a mindset. And it's something that we talked about. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a little late to be having the conversation now, as I indicated to Andrea postseason. But we know he can rebound, but he doesn't focus on it. I know he can do a better job of sliding over and helping in a weak side position. Probably will never be a great rim defender, if you will, just because, you know, you almost don't want a guy like that jumping up and challenging shots and risking injury in and around the paint uh, because of what you rely on him for in other areas. But getting over in a help position puts him in a position a, a lot of times to, to pick up easy fouls. And here's a guy that's our leading scorer. You want him to stay on the court. 
So there's a little bit of give and take there. Some of it's his fault, some of it might be ours. But can he be a better rebounder? I think absolutely. And, and that's a mindset and that's a desire thing and that's something that he's going to have to come to grips with. But with respect to his, uh, his upside, I think there is upside. And I do think that, you know, again, he deserves a little bit more credit for his post defense uh, in a man on ball situation because he's not bad and he has blocked some shots generally flat footed but his length has has been an issue You're, and when you talk about his value to this organization he is uh, a matchup nightmare for every team we're going into play night in and night out and I guarantee that he's one of the focal points of the scouting report every time they play the Toronto Raptors so uh, you've got to look at uh, the whole package when you're assessing his value. When, when you talk about getting that, that defensive-minded five, is that for the sake of getting a defensive-minded five or, or to overcome some of the deficiencies in Andrea's game? Probably both because we don't have that. And whether Andrea's is here or not, I would think that we would need a guy that can do those things. Defending the rim is a huge element of our game these days. And... Uh, Post defense, you know, as much as you want to say let's score in the low blocks, a lot of guys can score in the low blocks. You can post guards up. Andre has gotten better at posting it up. Uh, it doesn't always power to the basket, but uh, you know, there's there's things that that we can be doing as a group that improve that interior defense, and I think we need that regardless. Uh, in the draft, there happens to be a couple of guys that can possibly do that. The issue might be that they're probably more of what I'll call projects than immediate impact players. Uh, we have to make a determination whether or not we have the stomach to, to wait on a guy or do we take advantage of the assets that we have to go out and try to acquire that in some other form or fashion. We also have um, considerable cap flexibility. Again, how much? We don't know. I've got all different models built to try to ascertain exactly what those rules might might uh, yield but uh, there are a number of free agent bigs both restricted and unrestricted or some subject to options that we'll have to consider and some that fit the bill that that we talked about and you know I, again not to bring up something that's going to make me sick but uh, I had that guy last year in a deal that that fell through uh, in Tyson Chandler. Look what Tyson Chandler's done to Dallas's defense. You know that deal didn't happen. Can't worry about it now. 82 games have been played, and and uh, you know we're watching him play. But uh, it's not going to change my mentality of trying to go out and find that. So, again, if it's uh, a lot of people want to make the Andrea situation about me. And, uh, you know, because I drafted him, I need to defend. That's nonsense. I think I've proven that. Uh, I'm not afraid to, you know, admit when things don't work. Uh, I'm not afraid to make deals either. I think I'm also, uh, I've shown an ability to, you know, sacrifice, as, as Jay and I both did this year in terms of, uh, you know, putting the organization's interests ahead of our own. And, uh I'll do what's best for the organization all the time. You can be assured of that. You mentioned that the came into the season sort of one set of expectations and then sort of the reality of your situation made you sort of decide to retool of your approach. Yeah. When did that happen and what was that like? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I had a talk with uh, Pat Riley early in the season and um, we, uh, we, we talked about the ability to deal with losing and I asked him how he dealt with it when he coached a 15-win season one year. I think it was 15 wins. And he said, you know, you start the season like everybody else. You want to see what you have. And somewhere at about that 25% mark, you want to know what direction it's going. Or you're going to realize what you have. And, uh, you know, I've always had that, you know, same idea except... My idea was always to try to not tank or necessarily look to rebuild entirely because I always had the ability to manufacture enough of a, uh, 
of a deal package, if you will, that led to a more successful finish. I traded for Jason Kidd one year, December 26th, and we went from uh, an 0-13 start to going 40 and 42 and making the playoffs, and it set the platform for the next five years, and it was, it was a great run. Those deals aren't always there, but you look for them. And we had the tool, uh, as you all know, with the Chris Bosch trade exception to possibly make a deal like that. That's why I never quite said we're out of the woods with regard to let's put the rebuilding plan ahead of the possibility of making this right because you get assets in this business when those opportunities present themselves. I've always maintained that. And uh, it's, it's something obviously that, that we knew at some point on or about November 30th that, that we were headed down a, a path partly spurred by the injuries and uh, partly just looking at some of the things that were happening around the league that we, we did think it was in the best interest to go young, develop the young players, focus on maximizing that cap flexibility, whether it was acquiring more flexibility or preserving what we had and trying to acquire additional assets, even if it was chipping away at things. And I think we did that with Jared. That was a twofold deal. We, we got more cap flexibility and got a good young asset. And in the James Johnson deal, we uh, gave up a, a, an asset for an equal asset, if not a, a better one. And, uh, you know, the cap scenario was more or less a wash. So uh, even the Agensa deal, which was with Dallas, you know, we jumped into an opportunity to pick up a future second, our own, uh, some cash, and another prospect. Take a look at a young player that we knew probably, you know, needed to be looked at. He's, uh, again, I, I'm not even sure of uh, Alexi's age. I'm, I'm ashamed to say 22, 23, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, a good young player that, that's got a chance. If he, if he develops a little bit more of an inside presence, he's got a chance to do some things. Whether he does it here or not, I don't know. I can't, uh, I didn't make any assurances to any of the players in my exit interviews because there's too many uncertainties right now with regard to the roster, the makeup, the rules, the flexibility, what we do in the draft. But, uh, you know, he's, he's an interesting player also. I'm not going to say the answer to our woes in the middle, but uh, an interesting player nonetheless. Yeah, it's uh, $9.026 million left. Uh, we can use it right up until at least June 30th when the uh, current uh, CBA will expire and we will enter whatever moratorium that we normally enter. Uh, there's no telling what the future of that exception will look like. Um, again, the new rules will probably dictate some of that. Uh, we can use it beginning now to uh, acquire a player, but uh, I would tell you it's probably unlikely because now we're talking about chewing into that flexibility that we've created that was so valuable. It just depends on the piece. If, as I said, you get assets when assets are available, uh, I, I don't know what the status of that is, is going to be uh, moving forward, but we're going to explore all kinds of scenarios. Uh, we did use it to uh, piece together a few of the smaller deals. Uh, you know, going back. Um, Again, I've fallen under a little bit of criticism with regard to uh, not trading Bosch or not getting something for Bosch. Uh, at the end of the day, it was, a, it was pretty clear to me that uh, it was never in the best interest of this organization to trade Chris because the deals that everybody anticipated would be there were not there. I don't know how else to explain that other than to, to just tell you that I was on the phone with various people at various points, not necessarily actively shopping Chris because we never quite had that circumstance. We never had a circumstance where Chris stepped forward and said, I'm likely to be gone. Do what you can for the organization, but let's, let's work together to try to find the right position. It was always, I like being here. I love Toronto. I want to stay and, uh, you know, we'll move forward with an open mind. And uh, I don't think I would ever have put this organization in a situation to, uh, to, to open up the bidding on a Chris Bosch deal 
especially knowing what I knew about his, his value out there, I didn't think it was going to yield the right, the right kind of deal for us. So it was uh, something that obviously played out the way it did, and, and uh, it is what it is. But uh, we end up better for it in the long run because we don't have the weight of a $126 million contract stopping us from moving forward where we are now headed. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the silver lining to, the, to this, uh, this process. Brian, why do you need to clarify Jay's contract? Yeah, he's got an option year next year, and there's a date certain in June that he will, that we will need to uh, exercise whether or not that uh, option's exercised. What's the date in June? It's mid-June, mid-June. The average fan who just wants to know when you think this team with its core will be competitive, playoff competitive. What do you, I mean, you, you outlined to us, you know, what you have, mm -hmm. what you like, but you know, the average fan out there just wants to know when, when is this team going to be, you know, maybe trying for a playoff spot. What do you say? To that? I, I think a lot of them see, see what we're doing, uh, Brian, and, and there's a lot of, uh, and there's excitement about it. Uh, you know whether or not I can guarantee we'll be in the playoffs next year is is not something you know I can do right now because of all the uncertainty. Uh, whether or not we end up with the number one pick out of, coming out of the draft lottery, whether or not uh, that draft list on May 8th looks the way it does today, um, whether or not those trade conversations. And I know you want an answer, and I know others do, but uh, I, I can't provide that for you right now. It's not realistic to, to say this is when we will be there. Uh, but I can tell you we are making strides toward that direction without question. Everybody associated with the organization you know, feels it's, it's there in the future. Again, I'm not sure we could line it up any better. High draft pick. Good young developing talent, free agent flexibility or financial flexibility that's going to allow us to be reactive to the, whatever the new rules might look like. And uh, I believe assets that have trade value if we decide to trade people. So, you know, to make a prediction on what, whether or not you're going to make the playoffs, I'd like to say we're going to make the playoffs next year. I always say that. You know, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm shooting for every year. And hopefully it's in context of this, this growth toward not just making the playoffs, but building toward a contending team. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all want. With the uncertainty surrounding your position and, mm -hmm. and, and Jay's future, how tough is it and, and what's going to happen this summer? Uh, to maintain that growth going forward. You've got this young group of guys that walk away and go, don't know if the, my boss is going to be here, don't know if my coach is going to be here, don't know when my next game is going to be. How do you keep that moving forward in the face of all this uncertainty right now? Well, I think you know, we're doing the best we can with regard to uh, those postseason conversations with the players. Um, there's not a lot we can say. Uh, you know, some of it is uh, just the uncertainty of it all, but uh, you know, we, we all have to wait patiently in that regard. That's no different for anybody. Um, is your position, though, perhaps? The, the no, uh, look, look, as I've said to a lot of them, you know, I'm not certain whether I will be back, but uh, if I am, this is what we're doing. If I am, this is what I want to see out of you. If I am, uh, this, is, this is where this thing's going. So uh, I'm proud of what these young guys are doing. I'm proud of, uh, you know, the position that uh, we're in right now. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're geared, geared up for the future. The question is, is it going to take place? You know, I, I was more concerned. I'm not concerned about the players. They, they'll, they'll be fine one way or the other. I was more concerned about how my position affects others in this organization. Uh, some of that was addressed internally. Uh, I was able to you know, take care of the, some of the positions unrelated to coaching or maybe upper management that uh, I felt needed to be addressed. Uh, and uh, we've addressed that. And, and that's something that uh, I was happy to do. 
And at the same time, uh, you know, again, business as usual. I think we're moving forward as with our eye on whatever the target is. And the target right now is making this team better and, and the draft and free agency and all those things that I've mentioned. I get the sense that it's largely out of your control right now. And how frustrating for you personally, professionally. So. You know, this is uh, it's a tough business sometimes. You hear players say, you know, it's it's a business. Uh, it, it is. It's uh, I'm, I'm okay with it. I've I've seen enough, and I've you know dealt with circumstances enough that, uh, and this is the life I've chosen. I'm, I'm happy to have chosen this life, and uh, I'm very comfortable with with where things are. Like I said, I know that I, if if I'm not here, I'm going to walk out of here with my head high. And yeah, I was just going to say some people have. Uh, the perception or the, or the misconception that it's difficult to bring players, free agents to Toronto. Uh, earlier you were talking about the guys um, enjoy playing here. That is a victory mm -hmm. in and of itself. Mm -hmm. can, can you elaborate on that, some of the struggles you may or may not have in trying to attract free agents? Well, let's, uh, let's put it this way. If, um, if there's a chance to play in one of the major markets in the, in the United States, a Chicago, a New York, an LA. I don't think we'll ever win that battle. Uh, it's you know again, if if everything was on the table and it's apples to apples, uh, I'm just not sure you're gonna you're gonna win that battle. That's that's tough for any market to compete with. And I'm talking about you know 26 other NBA teams there that are, face that same concern. Um, but we have a system in place. We're gonna have arguably a new system in place that uh, you know is the basis of a competitive environment and um, you do your best with what you have I don't know how anybody could find a better city to live in I don't know how anybody can see how strong this economy is and and it's it's virtues uh, with respect to you know the people and and uh, culture and you know I can't it's a top five city in North America without debate and uh, whether or not you know we can convince uh, individuals that it's just as cold here as it is in about 15 other NBA markets you know it's a perception thing I think the perception sometimes gets you know distorted um, dollar for dollar in terms of contracts I, I think we can match those scenarios Taxes are not an issue if if I am structuring a new deal with a with a free agent player. Given the player is from North America, believe it or not, everyone thinks the advantages with the Europeans don't have those same advantages with the structure of the deals with the Europeans because of the tax agreements between countries. But uh, with respect to all things being equal. Uh, We've positioned ourselves to be a player in free agency. We have some flexibility. That money can be used to acquire free agents, or sign new free agents, or acquire players via trade. Can't lose sight of that side of this financial flexibility that we've created. And I've always said, I'm going to get, you know, if, if I can find a player via trade, it's a no. It's more of a known commodity than the unknown. Sometimes in free agency, and you do tend to overpay in free agency, no matter what market you're in. So I do think that uh, you know some of those things, those perceptions of this market being a you know tough place, is is distorted. I mean, all you got to do is look at this young, vibrant group of of mixed players. And when I say mixed, you've got Europeans, you've got North Americans, you've got all kinds of you know different. Uh, people in the room and I think they all love being here this year. Last year was a mess because we had some uh, some issues in the locker room. This year those issues didn't exist. So uh, I think winning will cure a lot of what maybe is out there right now and uh, we'll do our best to not only maintain that chemistry but to become much more competitive so that that winning uh, washes out any of those concerns that, that people might have. Just to follow up with that, what, what do you think led to the locker room being a more positive place this year as opposed to last, especially when you factor in you know, the mountain losses? 
I just think, uh, you know, overall, you know, the character of the, of the room uh, in general, uh, I think also just, you know, there, there might have been competing agendas last year uh, or issues that were somewhat insurmountable issues. Obviously, you know, the Chris Bosch free agency picture clouded things from day one. Uh, the acquisition of Hito and when things didn't, you know, necessarily move right, things started to splinter. Uh, but again, that's all so, that, that's something I don't want to necessarily rehash. This year, though, you've got a number of guys with the same goal. They all want to get better. They want to play. They, they want to compete. I'm not going to say we were free of of uh, any kind of issue because those things happen. They happen in families, they happen in, in, on teams, they happen in locker rooms. But we had a group of guys that genuinely liked each other this year and uh, it was nice to see. Did they always play as a team? No, I think we, uh, that was one of our faults. I think sometimes we played as individuals. Even though, again, we liked each other and we had the right group of guys, I think sometimes we played individually. When we moved the ball and shared the ball and got up and down the court, we were fun to watch and hard to beat. We didn't do it enough. And maybe at some point we didn't have the talent or the experience to do that enough. But you talk about some of the things we did this year, you know, some of the teams we beat, Boston, Chicago, Oklahoma City twice, uh, on and on. It, it's, and we were competitive in a lot of other games. But, uh, you know, again, Young team, inexperience, maybe a little bit of too much individual play, and those are things that we've got to address. Brian, recently, the, the NHL lockout was, I guess, a reality check for fans that you know owners will do whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it takes to sort of miss a season just to get what they want. The NFL, we see what's happening right now, and in the NBA, of course, on Friday we hear 22, 30 teams are, are going to lose money this year. So there's a perception out there that there is no way basketball is even going to be played next year. How optimistic are you that? you're going to be able to do something as far as like next year or is it wait 18 months maybe did you read the paper this weekend about LA and Phil Jackson I think I'll pass on the question no no offense but uh, it's can't can't disregard the uncertainty but uh, I know we're doing everything we can as a league to make sure that we play basketball but any other questions would need to go directly to uh, the league office about the NBA lockout, potentially, or whatever the, the labor situation is. Okay. You've been with the team a few years now, and you kind of broad stroke it. How, how do you see your time here in Toronto? How do you sum up? I'm sorry? How do you sum up your time in Toronto? You know, it's, it's um, you know, initially we came in and uh, had some success, maybe too much success too early. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we have not followed through uh, where where we started and uh, you know some of it I believe can be attributed directly to certain incidents all you got to do is look at the you know injury to Garbo host and I know it sounds like an eternity ago but that really set things in a downward spiral uh, we did make the playoffs the next year but it was uh, it was a difficult year uh, and then you you know, we looked at a few things to try to get better around Chris. It didn't work. And, uh, again, I'll take my share of the blame for that. Uh, at the same time, you need to uh, – I always look at the glass as, as half full, and we've done some, some positive things. And now we're in a position as we build without Chris Bosch, you know, we're building a good young team here, and, and there's some bright spots on the future – or on the horizon – and in the future that uh, I think, uh, you know, this market should be excited about. It's, uh, you know, you got to look at both sides of it. You know, I can't say on a win-loss perspective, no, but uh, just in terms of the passion that I bring to the business, uh, dedication to the organization, hopefully being a, a strong partner in the community and doing the right things for this organization over the last five years. Uh, you know, I, w I would hope that people think that, that I am the right guy. Again, in this business, um, you're not always going to be right. I think that's been proven. Uh, I've been doing this for 16 seasons.
and somehow, some way, I'm still, I've got an overall record above 500. And uh, given all the circumstances, given all the things that have been thrown at us, given the things that are sometimes uncontrollable, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's something that, that I can look at and say, I'm pretty comfortable knowing I, I do a decent job at, at what I do. And I know the business back and forth, and uh, you know, been through three sets of uh, labor negotiations, I've interpreted the rules each time, made the necessary adjustments to, to whatever those rules looked like. Uh, seen players come and go. I've got a great, uh, great number of relationships, very solid relationships in this business. I've made some very good draft picks. I've made some bad draft picks. I've made some good trades. I've made some bad trades. But again, uh, over time, you need to you know, look at some of the things you do on a whole and what that body of work looks like and, and know that uh, you're either the right guy for the job or not. But uh, one thing I would say is that continuity in this business is pretty important. And uh, you know, the ebb and flow of winning and losing, it, it really it happens to, to almost every franchise, some more than others. But uh, even the great ones take a tumble. You know, the Boston Celtics have taken a tumble. The Lakers struggled before making another deal for Pau Gasol. Uh, there's, there's been moments in, in that previous decade where, you know, they struggled earlier than that. But if, if you look historically at what people do in this business and, uh, you know, how long I've been doing it, I, I feel like I'm, I'm capable of, of doing this job and I'm, I'm still pretty young at it. Can I get better? Can I do, make more right decisions? Sure. We can all make more right decisions in our positions. And, uh, you know, you, you ride the highs and you ride the lows. It's, uh, it's a reality. Corey asked earlier about the existing players and mm -hmm. if you are back when you were talking about what you expect from them going forward, etc. What about given the uncertainty, how that affects deals you're trying to make for other players or you know, talking to kids that come in for pre-draft workouts and taking them out for dinner and selling them on the organization and your plan and your vision and seven days later your contract's up. I mean that, that would seem like it's got have an impact on your ability to try and sell the organization to potential free agents, players via trade and draft picks. Well Selling potential free agents won't happen until sometime after July 1st, so I'm not worried about that. Um, selling draft picks, at some point that becomes irrelevant because, you know, once you make the selection, they don't have much of a choice. Uh, but you do want to paint, obviously, a good picture. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, we're interviewing these kids. They're not interviewing us when you're looking at these, these players. And part of what they say and part of how they act, and, and uh, that's a big part of our evaluation. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll worry about the rest of it after the draft, but until then, you know, as much as I want them to get a good impression of Toronto uh, and, and this organization, um, you know, the, the draft process is, is really more of a one way direction. And, uh, you know, we'll deal with it accordingly. But, uh, you know, the free agency part, I think everything at that point should be, will be resolved. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just the easiest way I can answer that. Hey, guys, um, just in case, I, I am short on time because I've got to be at a meeting. But uh, so I'm going to avoid the scrum. Uh, process. Uh, if if you do have any more questions, I'd be happy to stay here for a few more minutes and and take those. But uh, I've got to move on. Sure. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, patience? You mentioned earlier that uh, you see times during the year when you may be able to make a deal and improve your team, but you have to worry about the rebuilding process. Mm -hmm. Were there any uh, particular instances of that this yeah. year where you said no to a deal? Yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that? Well, I can't name names uh, or be specific because that would be, unfortunately, uh, um, inconsiderate to the teams that I was talking to. And some of those players remain under contract. I do believe at 
various points throughout the year, I could have made deals that probably put us in a position to make the playoffs or at least compete for a playoff spot, but it would have been short-sighted on our part to make those deals. And so we put those deals to the side and we decided that uh, we would stay the course. But that's why I said all along, I, I reserve the right to, to utilize the exception, to maintain that flexibility. And uh, again, the right deal did not come along where we got a significant enough piece for the future that uh, we went ahead and made some sort of a transaction. But uh, you know, there were uh, at least two deals, such deals that would have put, you know, put us in contention for the playoffs that uh, again would have been short-sighted. Buddy. All the players pulling out of the draft sort of impressive. You know, we uh, you hear various things. I think uh, a number of the players are actually talking about returning to school for the right reason, because they want to return to school. It has nothing to do with you know some perceived uh, labor problem. It, it's more about you know there, there's a handful of these kids that interestingly really like the the process of, of being in school and, and competing and wanting to win a, an NCAA championship, something that they've been you know, programmed to think about, they want to do, and uh, that's their mindset. But uh, until we know the, the final list and what it looks like, uh, I can't tell you what some of those players are considering or thinking about. I, I do know that uh, you know, I've participated in you know, multiple scenarios where coaches call and try to get you know, some sort of a an opinion about their players. I've got. I've received several of those calls, and uh, I shared with them my own insights. And in most cases, uh, I said, you know, it was probably in the best interest of the young man to go back to school. I've always maintained that. But uh, again, until the rules change, you know, we've we've got to remain competitive and try to you know get the best talent to, despite the age and. Um, if it's a 19-year-old young man that's in the draft and he can help us, then you know, we're going to look at it.